shortened from what was handed to me a couple of days ago because of pressure of time about the days and weeks and months of his arrest and confinement in jail in China. It was the evening of June the 19th, 1952. Um, a group of about 12 Chinese soldiers armed with rifles, bayonets, revolvers and pistoled, pistols ordered Paddy Riley and Owen into a waiting room of the dispensary where they worked, where they remained surrounded with guns at the ready. Their names were called and a warrant for their arrest read out. They were charged with having organized the Reactionary Legion of Mary organization and other such reactionary activities. Ultimately, these were about two of 60 charges, all of which he persistently denied. He was then handcuffed, a rope put over his shoulders, brought under his armpits and tied tightly behind his shoulder blades. What was left was used as a lead with which the soldiers led him away. They arrived at the local police station where they surrendered their personal belongings, which, as we have heard, in Owen's case was a few safety pins, nails and buttons. He also had though a handkerchief, a notebook, his beads and the watch with which the people of Carnlock, which they had presented to him on the occasion of his ordination in 1945. They were then taken on a two and a half hour journey by boat to Tetsin prison and except for an occasional glance this was the last contact both Columbans were to have for the next 17 months. Owen and his other cellmates lay side by side in a 14 by 16 foot cell where mosquitoes and fleas turned out in full strength finding the blood of the new Irish arrivals a welcome change. <laughs> then started the relentless interviews. He was subjected to daily pressure from fellow prisoners who formed a group under instruction from the Red Guards. There were group meetings and as the new boy he was the centre of attention. These meetings lasted eight hours during which he could only move if he obtained permission and even then only allowed to stand for a two minute stretch. They kept shouting at him, are you deaf? Did you not hear the question? He thought he was going to go mad. So in order to gain relief he coolly told them what communism was and what Catholicism was. This in further infuriated the soldiers and he was taken to another room where he was surrounded by them, made to stand under a light and stay there for the next six hours with his feet together, hands by his side and not to move. All the while there was a soldier in each corner of the room, one beside him and one at the door all equipped with rollers and pistols. We now move to their solitary, his solitary confinement in Kaching. In his memoirs, Owen talks about the new cell he ended up with being about half the size of the previous, six by three, reminiscent of a peak sty with a raised portion for sleeping on. He was eventually given a brush to clean it and he tried washing the floor with what little water he had and a piece of his clothing. It took him over 10 weeks and kept him busy. Food was initially good but after three weeks it was down to steam rice twice a day with a few spoonfuls of cabbage and an occasional piece of pork. The bread was half baked and Father Ronan was able to make the beads of his rosary from it. Father Owen made his rosary out of rotten strings which he tied together. He kept this in his breast until one day it fell out when taken for his interview after which he was reprimanded loudly. At one point in time he had to keep repeating to himself I am sane, I am sane. But then he thought you won't be sane for much longer if things go on like this. So he knew he had to do something different. He started then to play with the red ants, flies and spiders which were plentiful in his cell as a means of diversion as we say in the north of Ireland. He killed the mosquitoes. 
And like much of his story, he describes this in great detail in the Four Felons book. Interrogations began again the first week of August. They tried to frighten him with threats, uh, such as spending the rest of his day without friends, relations no one to speak to, bad food, no fresh air, sickness and suffering. He replied to each of the same, if that is the price, I could at least try. On September the 15th, extremely fatigued, legs weak, arms too heavy for his shoulders, he could stand it no longer. He asked the judge if he could sit down. Instead, he was sent back to his cell to reflect and ready himself for a confession. The winter of 1952 to 3 was the toughest time physically for him. His body succumbed to dysentery, which lasted for six weeks, and very, very caused by malnutrition. It began by swelling in his toes and feet, and which travelled up through his body, wreaking havoc. His skin dried off and fell off, his muscles wasted and his bones creaked. His hair fell out, his eyesight became very weak and his eyes glued together. Finally he received medication, but his body was so emaciated that he couldn't bear to place his hand on his chest, it was like rubbing naked bone. He could count his bones in his hands and his knees were protruding like huge swellings. His body was in a state of unimaginable filth with only occasional cold water to wash. At first he was unable to stand and in order to prevent himself getting hurt he had to kneel before getting to his feet because being a tall man he felt it was less damaging a height to fall from. On the fort, oh, sorry, on the 11th of November 1953, all felons, all four felons, were again subject to court examination by a judge who this time practically knew everything about the Catholic Church. By the 22nd of November, he felt that release was perhaps imminent when they asked for his coat so that they could air it. They were all then allowed to take a hot bath and a shave. On the 23rd, a day Columbus know well, they were taken to the courtroom where all their clothes and possessions lay on the floor. They were told to identify their belongings, but an item was missing, the watch and the wireless they had taken from him in 1951. There was a stubbornness in him, surprise, surprise, that he refused to leave China without his watch and wireless. He kept asking for them for two days and gave the names of the officials who took them and they were eventually returned. Their photos and fingerprints were taken and this resulted in their being expelled from China forever. At this point he got a crack in the side of the head by an excited soldier when he failed to remove his hat. When he first saw fathers Riley, Ronan and Casey he said their appearance was frightful. They looked like men back from the grave. Thin, tired, stiff and old looking. Finally they were sent on the 78 mile journey with six armed guards by railway to Hong Kong and freedom via the barbed wire fences of no man's land. And we were told in Belfast it was the only time in his life he was glad to see a unite, a, what do we call it, a Union Jack. <laughs> Stop it in the air. <laughs> Father Riley was unable to walk and own only with great difficulty. The guard had the revolver pointed at his ribs, which he, which he thought seemed fo too foolish to be possible, considering he was unlikely to run away, given that he could hardly walk. Father uh, Riley and himself collapsed with exhaustion over the border, no doubt feeling relief that their ordeal was finally over. It was now the 28th of November, 1953. And finally, um, 
In his account of the time in the various Chinese jails, Owen finishes with the following. I have painted, I fear, a rather grim picture of life in Chinese communist jails. But before I end, there was something I want to add. Of my 15 months in Kaxing jail, I can recall only, only two days on which I was unhappy. One of them was Christmas Day 1952, when my thoughts tore loose from their narrow moorings and sped, in spite of me, to, um, to, to Ireland, Antrim, and home. Thank you.